Can I see a hand or a smile or nobody is listening? Apparently, nobody has the earphones on or does not does, has not selected the right channel. Does anybody hear the English channel or the English interpreters, so, so to speak? Nobody? Nobody? Yes, I can see you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. No, we, I just wanted to, to test the channels. Thank you. Now I'm looking for a French customer, a French-speaking customer. Nobody. Well, taking our cue from this morning, thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Working Group One. Uh, we are very happy to see such uh, a very full house to attend the dialogue in Working Group One. Uh, my name is Clarence Nelson. I'm a committee member and uh, co-moderating with me today uh, is Christina, to my left here, from uh, Chicago in the United States of America. And uh, Group 1 is dedicated to a discussion of children as human rights defenders in the online space. This morning, uh, our program is there will be three dialogues. The first dialogue will deal with civil society space for children as human rights defenders. And the speakers for that will be uh, Jean McDonald, who is the head of the human rights team of the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations here in Geneva. Uh, Jean, where are you? Yes, we have her here. Thank you. And... Together with Jean will be Amy, 17 years old from Canada. Amy, thank you. The second dialogue will be empowerment through digital media. And the speakers for that will be Regina Jensidotter. Did I get that right? Yeah, Probably not, Regina, but yes. From the Council of Europe, uh, accompanied by Foisel. Foisel, no? no. Melissa. It's Melissa. Melissa. Okay, there's been a change. It's Melissa from Brazil, 17 years of age. Where are you, Melissa? Thank you. Yes. And the third and final dialogue will be on child-led initiatives and protection online. And for that, we have Tomo Massa, Tomo Massa uh, former youth representative of the study group on social media in Japan, and Konstantinos from Greece. Thank you for everyone joining us here this morning for your, to share your expertise and your experience. Just uh, for those who uh, wish to, for Tomo Masa in particular, for the Japanese to English translation, that will be on Channel 6. Channel 6. The rapporteur for our working group is Kirsten Sandberg, sitting over there. Uh, together with Monica here from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who will be assisting us. At the end of the day, they will present a preliminary set of conclusions coming out of the debate in this working group. Some rules for our dialogue. Time is very uh, essential 
there are a lot of you, and I would imagine there will be a lot of people wanting to ask questions and make comments. We are allowing, uh, in respect of each dialogue, half an hour, and we have three dialogues, so that's 45 minutes. So, as you can see, time will be very, very critical. In the dialogue, 15 minutes will be um, given for the uh, actual dialogue between the speakers, and then 15 minutes will be allowed for questions and answers. If you wish to raise a question or make a comment, please raise your hand, and uh, we'll keep a note of uh, who wants to raise a comment or ask a question, and uh, you will be given a maximum of two minutes, please, for your question or comment. I will be very strict, so I don't want to interrupt you, but please try and keep to the two minutes. Uh, without further ado, I will give the floor over to my co-moderator, Christina, who is going to formally introduce the, the children and the adults who are involved in each of the three dialogues this morning. Christina, the floor is yours. Hello all, thank you for joining us here today. Please join me in welcoming Jean McDonald, head of the human rights team of the permanent mission of Ireland to the United Nations here in Geneva. Uh, the child speaker today will be Amy, who is 17 from Canada. Good morning, Ooh, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, still, we're still in the morning. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Amy. So thank you very much, Christina. Uh, I would like to begin by saying that it is a true honor to be here today representing my country and the Inter-American Children's Institute. I'm equally pleased to be here with Jean McDonald, head of the human rights team in the permanent mission of Ireland, to discuss the importance of children's voices as defenders of human rights and how online platforms can amplify these voices. As an online youth, course, as an online youth journalist who reports about human rights issues in the Americas, I'm incredibly grateful to have found a supporting organization that provides me with a platform to share my opinions and research. I have them to thank for being here today. Ms. McDonald, I'm interested to know how the youth voices of Ireland are making themselves heard. Well, thank you very much, Amy. Um, and like you, I'm delighted to be here today. It's a real honor for, for me to be involved in this panel, and thank you to the organizers and the co-moderators for facilitating it. Um, so it's a pretty big question, actually, that, that you asked today. I think for, from, from our perspective nationally, what we've noticed in Ireland over the last um, couple of decades is that the place of children in Irish society has changed. And I think uh, what we see is that more and more, both through formal and informal channels, children and youth are having their voices heard in, in a more effective way. So on the formal channels, which is obviously the area that I'm mostly involved in, we see more structural changes have taken place. So we have now a dedicated minister who has responsibility for children and youth affairs and who sits at our cabinet table and so has a very powerful voice um, in government. We have several strategies that have been launched by that minister over the last couple of years to uh, create an enabling environment for young people and children to have their perspectives heard, not just on issues that are traditionally seen as child or youth issues, but also on wider issues. So forward-looking, because um, policies that are changing today will impact on the adults of tomorrow, and that's why it's so important that the voices and perspectives of young people are heard, both as young people but also because they will, be the, they will be the adults of tomorrow. So that's the formal stuff. And then on the informal side, I think what we're seeing more and more, and I, and I suspect this is replicated in Canada, and I'd be really interested to hear your, your views on this, Amy. But what we see more and more is that uh, children and young people are connecting across, using the online space to connect. So that's very much issues-based, so it may be around a particular uh, political issue. And in Ireland, we've seen several cases of significant social change where the voice and impact of young people and children has fed through to the, the outcome of and the outworkings of, of those, that social change. Thank you. That's, um, regarding what you mentioned about Canada, I, I do see it being somewhat similar to Ireland. Yep. However, what's quite missing, in my opinion, is that youth are given an opportunity to speak, however, are still not viewed at the same level as adults. Adults will listen to what youth have to say, however, it's quite rare that those opinions are being taken 
into actual actual action that are being taken and made into actual policies. For me personally, I have to wait until I'm elected to be able to see my policies put into action, and by that time, those policies will most likely be, you know, the past. So a question that I also have is, how do you see technology influencing children and youth engagement in politics? Well, that's, I think that's a really interesting one, because, I mean, for me, even before you look at how technology influences in that particular space, I mean, I think we have to accept that technology is almost part of our DNA now, isn't it? Correct. So it's impossible to kind of, to try and separate it out from anything, any kind of policy shaping or formation is also, is almost a... Uh, could somebody ask the speaker to speak into the mic because the interpreter cannot hear her properly? We see technology and, and children and youth kind of interfacing is that obviously we are, uh, and I'm much, much older than you and much more, I'm not as tech savvy, I'm sure, as certainly as my, my nieces and nephews. But I think what we see now is that the generations coming up are much more comfortable using technology, um, are way ahead of adults in this space. So it's uh, almost, I think, the... the um, because I think for, for children and youth, it's a much more natural thing to use technology, to harness technology, to reach out to one another, to progress issues that you, you, know, that you care about, that you feel are important, and to make your voices heard. So um, I, I think it's, it's an integral part. Could somebody ask the speaker to speak into the mic because the interpreter cannot hear her and I cannot interpret into French? It, it's just impossible to separate them out anymore. Okay. Sorry, I apologize. Je suis not um, so, so yeah, I think technology, it's, it's, an, it's an essential part of um, the, the, the process because it's simply impossible to separate it out. To add on to that, uh, how you mentioned how online platforms are a great way for human rights defenders to have their voices heard. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, one thing I've noticed is that the barriers are being taken away while youth are using online platforms. I had the honor of being able to connect with youth from across Canada in one giant voice, uh, voice conference or online conference. And in Canada, that's something that's quite rare because traveling across Canada, it's about five hours flying in every direction. So it's simply impossible to be able to connect all at once. But technology has permitted us all to be able to do that. And that's truly something that I'm very grateful for and hope that in the future, this technology will be able to use to connect people worldwide all at the same time, which I realize is being done, however, on a larger scale. I think that's really interesting. And, and although geographically our countries are, the scale is very different. Yes. But I think the challenge is similar because for a, an, a, a young person in Ireland or any person in Ireland, I mean, we, we live on a small island. So trying to connect with people in other parts of the world is challenging. And what technology has allowed us to do is break down those barriers and no longer, you know, is it um, an impediment to dialogue and exchange. And I think because for younger, uh, for younger people, for younger generations, it's a much more natural process, it's not even seen that these, these geographical barriers aren't even really recognized anymore because they simply don't exist. And we see a kind of um, collation around, around issues. And it doesn't matter if you're in Winnipeg or Dublin. If you care about the same issue, you're able to share and exchange views. Another question that I uh, would like to ask is, why is it important for other nations to value Ireland's experience regarding youth participation in decision making? Well... I suppose the, um, we would like to feel that the steps and measures that we've taken um, in recent years provide good examples of what can be done at the national level to support better engagement um, for young people and for children. Um, but, I mean, I'd say two things about that. The first is that, um, you know, as, as states here at the United Nations, and, and obviously that's my lived experience at the moment representing my country here, um, it's important for us all to share good practices across all policy areas. So some things we will do very well, but maybe other things not so well. So the benefit is really having a, having a facility and a forum to exchange ideas and, and, and uh, share uh, what has worked well for us and, and what maybe hasn't worked so well. And the second point I, I would make is that, you know, when Ireland, um, 
was looking at developing um, our various strategies. So we have a specific strategy which is aimed at the under 18s, which is all about um, participation in decision making. And that's the, the title of the strategy because it's not just about kind of you know, ticking a box exercise. It really is about how do we ensure that the under 18s are able to contribute to policy formation and shaping at the national level. And that was hugely influenced by the activities of here at the UN by the, uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So I think what we see here in our, from an Irish perspective, and, and I hope that this would be the experience of other states at the UN, is the benefit of multilateralism because it's the forum where we can come together to share experiences, to learn from one another. And sometimes, you know, we, we as others need to have a mirror held up to us where we're told, well, you know, you need to make improvements here. And I think that that was hugely beneficial for us in this specific policy area where the committee was able to make, uh, we were able to learn from best practices and recommendations of the committee. Uh, one of my last questions was, if you could share a case or example of how online civil society spaces have influenced or created change in Ireland? Um, I suppose one, one very striking example of that would be um, the momentum that was created online um, in advance of a referendum, a constitutional referendum, which uh, took place in Ireland um, three years ago now. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how quickly the time flies by. Uh, so we had a referendum on marriage equality in 2015. And although, uh, and obviously the age of franchise is 18, so we're, we're talking about a slightly different demographic, but I think that the, it, it demonstrates the, the point. Um, there was a really significant home to vote movement because in Ireland you must be resident in the country to, to exercise your right to vote. So that, that's how our, our legal framework works. Um, but if you've been out of the country for a specific period of time, you retain that right. And because this was very much an issue that the younger generation cared deeply about, um, we saw a significant mobilization online around this hashtag home to vote, which was encouraging young Irish people to get back to Ireland so that they could exercise their right to vote in the referendum. So you had all these really incredible scenes of young people traveling home together on flights, on boats from the UK, so that they could exercise their right to vote. And it really became something that, um, beyond a very party political issue, it was, a, it was gathering around a, an issue of social change where the political establishment um, absolutely, um, you know, recognized that this was a manifestation of young people coming together and wanting to influence social change. In Canada, we had something similar happen in recent years. Uh, it was a trend uh, called welcoming newcomers. So across many social media platforms, uh, we had lots of youth specifically uh, posting pictures of newcomers in their schools and how they were creating meaningful relationships and connections with these youth. Uh, this was spread across all provinces in Canada, and it uh, was mentioned on many national, um, national broadcasting uh, outlets. And for me, it really brought to attention the, the fact that although people come from all different backgrounds, when they came to Canada, they felt the need to welcome each other, and they were able to do that through the use of social media. And for me, that, that's Fantastic. just such a wonderful way that technology can be used to welcome people. And Absolutely. Now, that's a wonderful example. Wonderful example. Thank you very much, Jean and uh, Amy. Um, mm -hmm. We now uh, allocate time for questions and, uh, and comments from the floor. Please, uh, as I indicated, raise your hand if you do have a question or comment to make. Uh, please observe the two-minute time limit. And perhaps when you, before you make your question or comment, just indicate your name and, and uh, sort of what you, what you do uh, in, in as short a time as possible. The floor is now open for questions uh, and comments. Yes, Oris. Good afternoon. It's five after 12 now. I'm Oris Novosad. I'm with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I have the honor and privilege of working with the Child Rights Committee. Um, when we talk about the use of social media in terms of protection of human rights defenders, um, have you also thought about the flip side of it and how social media can be um, something that could be a threat? Um, and we've seen that. There was a release today 
on a certain country on, on the situation of human rights defenders in that. And I know that that country, the individuals in that particular country are very concerned of how you use social media. And so what elements are you doing as young people, as children and youth, to draw attention to that aspect so that proper technologies are used in a corrective manner and that they're not an actual threat um, to young human rights defenders? Um, to answer that question, I agree with you, your statement that the use of technology, there's a positive side and there's also a downside. Because youth are sharing so much about themselves so openly on social media, there are chances, or the, it happens quite often, where people will be bombarded with you know, negative comments or just berated. And specifically regarding children and human rights defenders, because they're often advocating for issues that might not be supported by government, they, they are essentially a, a huge target. And a way that, in my opinion, we can go about um, protecting you know, these individuals on social media is really being careful of what is being said and even the appearance of people while they are in, in, uh, on social media as well. It's, it's quite unfortunate in countries where people aren't able to show themselves as freely as in other countries, but what needs to be countered is not the use of social media, but how those governments are restricting the use of social media. I believe that social media is a fantastic way for human rights issues to be advocated, but if there are restrictions on these, there is no way for that to be possible. I think that's a really interesting question and, and, and a really interesting answer from, from you, Amy, because uh, from my perspective, sitting here in Geneva, um, you know, the issues that we, Ireland, prioritize at the Human Rights Council are largely around these issues, civil society space, the rights of human, uh, human rights defenders, the rights to freedom of expression, and so on. And it's a real example of what I alluded to earlier, that in, in, in progressing these objectives, we're often catching up with the technology because it is moving so quickly. So it's a huge challenge for us here as um, policy shapers to try and get the balance right because as, as Amy pointed out, one of the massive challenges around the use of social media is actually restrictions. And obviously that's not something we, want, we would want to support in any way, shape or form. So um, we, I mean, we, we work hard here at the council through the various resolutions to try and tackle that in the most appropriate manner, but it remains a huge challenge, I think. And because technology is advancing at such a rate and, and multilateralism, as, as you know, RS, doesn't uh, move at the same pace, it can be a real challenge for us, I think. Thank you. We have a question here. Hello, I'm, I'm Claire Nevin and I'm working for the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders and I also happen to be Irish, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, the question there that you just posed, it really got me thinking. Um, and I was also reflecting on what Jean was saying about recent social movements in Ireland which were very technology oriented and you had a lot of mobilisation on technology. And it just brought to my mind that there was concerns among civil society in Ireland of how safe um, we were and the civil society were in mobilising online and the idea was not to move away but to create safer channels and you had the Irish Council for Civil Liberties amongst others who actually organised trainings for civil society, for human rights defenders around reproductive sexual health rights, probably in the last campaign as well, the one that Jean alluded to wasn't there for that one but the one around marriage equality I'm sure the same thing happened I know that this was very helpful for civil society and I was myself amongst those at the time and we had the trainings and we knew okay we can go through these platforms maybe instead of Skype we should use something else that's more secure and I just wanted to ask Amy um, if you think that young people human rights defenders children human rights defenders have enough knowledge about maybe alternative platforms um, for, for mobilizing things like Signal where you're less likely to, to be you know, in danger or to be exposed. If this is something that people in the human rights movement or people like myself working for Amanda and Human Rights Defenders should be more conscious of promoting um, and if the civil society is doing enough to raise awareness of alternative channels for you to be more secure in your work. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. There's a lot of work that does need to be done. It started off with having channels 
that were, you know, quite useful. However, as you have mentioned, a lot of those now are not as safe as they were before. Personally, I am not as knowledgeable about safer channels as I would like to be, and that is actually something that I am currently, once I return to Canada, will be looking into more. So I agree that we definitely need more channels that are safer, and education is the biggest thing that needs to be uh, addressed right now, personally in my country, and even for human rights defenders around the world. Having education and having safe channels will ultimately be the, the best option for everybody. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Tara Collins. I am both Irish and Canadian, and I represent uh, the International and Canadian Child Rights Partnership. I want to thank you both very much for your, your contributions today. And um, I, f I found it interesting, uh, Jean, is it um, your description of the difference between older folks who I have heard been uh, described as digital immigrants and younger folks uh, described as digital natives. And my question to you both, if I may, is to ask you, what do you see as um, the potential uh, opportunities for both digital natives and digital immigrants to work together um, with, through social media in order to support protection and per, uh, participation, promotion of empowerment, and learning more about it through research? You first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, your question, Tara. Um, I mean, you, you, uh, I suppose I, I would come back a little to the, the first point that I made, or one of the only points that I made, is that, you know, we, we mustn't even see it as an opportunity. It's a fact. So we, we have to create that space. I think that's the, the absolutely incontrovertible fact. So, um, you know, the... the, the, the it, we must look at, as states, and obviously I'm here, you know, representing government, we have to look at opportunities um, and, and spaces where we can bring these two together because it's happening and we must be engaged. And that's our responsibility as, you know, the, as, as the state to make sure that we're, we're engaging properly uh, with, with all, all, all the, the frameworks that are out there now and, and the digital space is moving as, as so quickly, as I said. I think these points about protection are, are critically I mean, can, just cannot be ignored because we're constantly trying to find that right balance, I guess. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking even, I, I frankly don't even know what Signal is, so I was jotting that down to, to look up. But I think it really illustrates the point that we have so much to learn one from the other. And I think it, ha and it has to be a dialogue, it has to be an exchange, uh, because it's not just about throwing out the old either. It's about bringing the two together in a meaningful way so we can both progress essentially the same objectives that we have. The phrase that youth is the future is often heard. However, if we want change to happen now, youth have to collaborate with adults. And that's essentially the point that's being made. We need to have a collaboration of both the old technology and the new technology to come together so that current action can be taken. And that it's not just in the future that current actions is really being taken. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We have a gentleman there first, and then... Hi, um, my name is Didier Muller and I'm uh, currently an intern for Edinburgh International. Um, you both mentioned just then, just in the previous question, how um, the younger generation uses social media to discuss um, political moments and pivotal um, movements in their country's history. My question is whether you see social media as a potential platform for intergeneration dialogue. I ask this because my own country, the UK, has in recent times suffered from a great divide between younger voters and older voters in appreciating um, moments and turning points in recent history. So do you see social media as a platform of bridging the divide? And can you give any examples of your own experiences and how um, social media has been a platform for appreciating the different political views of each generation. Thank you. And we'll take the question here before we ask the panelists to answer. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ruben Brower. I'm also with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, working on women's rights and gender. Um, I had a question um, particularly to, to Amy as well, uh, in relation to the online space and, and how that experience and the challenges online uh, for girl defenders and for boy defenders is in, in, in your, have, you know, your own experience, but also in the experience of, of your work would be very interesting to hear about that as well. Thank you. I'll pass it over to our panelists to uh, respond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you uh, the intergeneration? Yep. Uh, regarding the question about uh, intergenerational divide, I do see technology right now being really primarily used um, by youth. And I'd really like to see adults and older generations feel welcomed and a, like a part of social media. Once older generations do feel like they can be a part of social media and that they are welcomed and, and whatnot, I do believe that what you said about intergenerational, um, the divide will disappear. I, I do see it right now. I haven't had much um, experience on social media communicating with older generations simply because personally, like, my grandparents don't use social media. They don't. Even my parents don't use social media. Therefore, I believe in, there's almost an, an invite that needs to be put out so that older generations feel as well that they are welcome and that once they are on social media, the, the impact will be so much, so much bigger. Um, I think that's a, a for, for me, what I have noticed in my professional life is the change around the use of social media because I think it's not helpful to see it as just social media belongs to the younger generation mm -hmm. because then we'll never move, move beyond seeing it as anything other than something for, for young people to be playing with. And it's much more than that, as we know. What I've noticed in my professional um, life is how in the last, I would say, 18 months, um, my colleagues, some older, most older, uh, and a few of the younger ones, have, have, have there's really been a takeoff of use of social media um, by my colleagues. And obviously, working in a foreign service, we're spread out all over the world. So all of a sudden, we see you know, many, many, many of our permanent missions, our embassies, our consulates are all on, on social media, and then our colleagues who are working there. So it has forced um, a new generation, if you like, a slightly older generation, to really engage with it. And I think it's a really great example of how that, of, of breaking down that generational uh, question around use of social media. But I must say, in my personal life, um, it's not something I see. I mean, my, my parents are both in their 80s and uh, would be, you know, anathema to them to even think about social media. But um, certainly in the professional world, I think it's, it's cre creating change. And that will have impacts because, you know, many of my colleagues are, are, are in their 60s and now on Twitter and so on. So that's having an impact in their personal spaces. And I think that's really positive and really welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our time has uh, run over a little bit, uh, so we will have to uh, cease with this dialogue at this stage. But uh, could we give uh, Jean and Amy, please, a hand? And I now call on uh, my co-moderator, Christina, to please introduce our next uh, panelist for Empowerment Through Digital Media. Um, our first speaker would be Regina Jens Dota, um, Council of Europe, and the title speaker today will be Melissa, who is 17 years old, from Brazil. Bom dia a todos. É, muito feliz em participar é, desse momento e de poder trazer um pouco da experiência. Thank you very much. I would like to um, thank you for being here. And I'm honored to be able to bring a little bit of my life experience here. Good morning. My name is Regina Janstutir. I'm the coordinator for the rights of the child in the Council of uh, Europe. Uh, the Council of Europe, for those of you who come outside of uh, Europe, uh, is a, a human rights organization, uh, a regional organization of 47 member states, and we have uh, for many years had uh, programs uh, on uh, protecting and promoting the rights of the child. Uh, our core mission is to support our member states to uh, implement better the UN Convention for the Rights of the Child. Uh, so uh, 
digital, uh, uh, the digital environment is, a, is an important environment where we have been uh, progressing with work. Um, we have also done quite a lot of work uh, in the area of child participation uh, together with uh, some of you who are here today. We have uh, adopted recommendations uh, for our member states to strengthen the participation uh, uh, and the voices of children in policy making, in justice, in health, uh, in family matters, etc. Uh, and the digital environment, uh, uh, of course, is, 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 uh, is one space uh, where uh, we can uh, listen to the voices of children. Um, but I have to admit that uh, the topic of uh, today's uh, discussion for me was absolutely fascinating uh, because uh, to meet uh, with uh, children human rights defenders was something that uh, we in the Council of Europe had not really thought about. And uh, I think that we had not uh, uh, thought about, um, because we, we have done quite a lot of work for human rights defenders in the Council of Europe. Uh, and this day of, uh, of discussion allowed me to reach out to my colleagues elsewhere in the Council of Europe and those that are working specifically on human rights defenders and ask them, so, you know, how uh, is the legal framework that we have in the Council of Europe, to what extent does it actually apply also to children? Um, and uh, I feel that the work that we, or my sector, has been doing on promoting the participation of children, providing access to information, child-friendly information, etc., has been um, taken to another level and given me a, a uh, uh, an additional opportunity to, to take uh, participation of children to another level. And I will definitely uh, uh, hold my colleagues accountable for uh, those that are working on human rights defenders so that we can mainstream and make sure that uh, they are also looking at uh, children as human rights defenders. And who knows, it might even take us uh, a bit further and perhaps uh, this is an area which we could uh, support our member states more. Empowerment uh, of, uh, uh, of children uh, in uh, uh, the digital environment is uh, important, especially for children, uh, human rights defenders. And I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to exchange uh, and to have a conversation with Melissa, who is um, a human rights defender, and she is working on uh, protecting uh, children in her country from violence, from discrimination, uh, and has a long-standing uh, experience in, in, uh, in her country in upholding, uh, and upholding children, um, children's rights. Uh, and um, so for us it was important perhaps to, in our preparation, to listen to Melissa and to see to what extent uh, the Internet has been an opportunity or potentially a, a, a risk, the digital environment, an opportunity and a, and a risk uh, for uh, uh, her work. So my question was uh, uh, to, uh, to Melissa, to what extent uh, has the internet uh, created opportunities for you to convey the, uh, the, the messages uh, uh, of your uh, organization and, uh, and your views uh, in, the, in the digital uh, environment as a human rights defender? Bom, é, no Brasil eu faço parte do monitoramento jovem de políticas públicas. Uh, in Brazil, I work um, monitoring public policies. A youth group that, that is called Mon, uh, Young Monitoring of Public Policies, that works along with World Vision. There is simultaneous interpretation? Yeah. Oh. É, e é um, um programa nacional, uma, um movimento nacional, onde está presente em quase todos os estados do Brasil. E como nós não estamos é, o tempo inteiro juntos pessoalmente, nós utilizamos muito das mídias e redes para que o nosso trabalho seja efetivo. O nosso trabalho dentro do movimento é monitorar as políticas públicas existentes na nossa comunidade de forma que nós identificamos as políticas que 
as políticas que é, estão em deficiência e buscamos soluções para que elas sejam melhoradas. Ok. Uh, so, we have many different groups all over Brazil, which is a, a very large country. So, uh, the digital media made possible for us to communicate and, and spread our information throughout the country. And uh, our work is mainly to uh, these, these small groups, they gather together in their community, and the young people from that community uh, makes uh, some questions around to find out which public policy needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. what is missing in the community. So after they do this, uh, we take this to the government and talk to them and see how can we solve the problems. If we don't have enough help, we'll see how to build a new hospital. If we don't have uh, education, maybe hire new teachers. Através disso, todo o nosso contato com grupos de outros estados e outras localidades é feito através das redes sociais e isso cria uma unidade entre todo o movimento, fazendo com que funcione e que escolas sejam reformadas tanto na Bahia quanto no Rio de Janeiro é, e que o Brasil se torne cada vez melhor em políticas públicas através do nosso trabalho e da nossa conexão com as redes sociais. So, uh, through, uh, through the digital media, we communicate with all our groups all over the country and make sure that all schools that, uh, all schools that need to be built can be built and all hospitals that uh, need to be uh, remodeled or whatever they can be. And uh, that's how we make it work uh, in all the country. Além disso, nós fazemos formações é, sociais e políticas e é, fazemos com que esses jovens que nós trabalhamos se sintam empoderados e através do conhecimento que eles adquirem. E nós divulgamos isso nas nossas redes sociais, na nossa página no Facebook, que tem mais de 7 mil curtidas. É, e vamos criando essa rede de empoderamento e de conhecimento para a juventude. Uh, the, the, this network is also important to empower our leaders. It's a, a, a way to share information, to train new leaders, to build uh, new perspectives for them. So uh, social media is very important to uh, spread, the, share the knowledge. And, uh, thank you. I, I'll keep my questions... Uh, Sure. But do you think that, uh, I mean, the Internet is a, an important space, uh, as you've just said, uh, to convey the messages to, uh, to the leaders of, uh, of uh, where you are, are organizing your work. But uh, do you think that uh, the Internet in, or the digital environment, this connection, creates uh, a better space for them to really listen and to consider what you have to say, or do they uh, feel threatened by the uh, opportunities that you have to express uh, your concerns and recommendations? Você acha que é, você já colocou o trabalho que você faz de, de, de dividir o conhecimento, tá? mas você acha que as pessoas que atuam com vocês no, no MJ Pop, elas se sentem seguras e elas são levadas a aprender mais? Ou, de alguma maneira, elas podem se sentir ameaçadas pela rede, não se sentir seguras de, de falar o que pensam? É, nós tentamos, dentro do, do, do movimento, criar um espaço é, que seja o máximo acolhedor e o máximo é, seguro possível. We try to, to, we try to create the most welcoming and safe environment uh -huh. as possible. Então, nós... O nosso desejo é fazer com que os jovens enxerguem no nosso movimento um lugar onde eles podem ter suas vozes ouvidas e, na verdade, que eles estão lá para ter suas vozes ouvidas. We not only want them to feel welcome to speak, but we want them to know that we uh, they are safe to speak and that we hope that they do speak to us. This is where the voices will be heard. 
Então, dessa forma, é, através do conhecimento das formações, nós fazemos é, com que eles entendam que eles são construtores da sua própria realidade, defensores dos seus direitos e que dentro do nosso espaço eles têm total liberdade para fazer isso da forma que for melhor para eles. So, uh, our focus is always on formation and on teaching and training mm -hmm. and uh, we hope that everyone gets to know that they are made to be leaders, to be human rights defenders and that we are there for them whenever they need us. I think this is uh, this is uh, very interesting. What I what I'm uh, particularly interested to see also is uh, to uh, uh, to what extent can uh, uh, we use uh, the digital uh, environment, uh, social media, really to to convey very strong messages through campaigning, through online. Uh, campaigning, which is often uh, a challenge. I can share a little bit uh, one of the, the, uh, uh, the, the priorities of the Council of Europe is to, to protect children from sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. And in order for uh, us to uh, be able to inform children of their rights under the Lanzarote Convention, uh, we wanted to uh, have a child-friendly version of the Lanzarote Convention because I think that's also an important uh, element of online uh, uh, campaigning is for children to understand uh, uh, their rights. And the Internet has definitely created a, a big space for us as an organization to, to, uh, to inform uh, children of their rights. But it was only uh, once uh, children became involved in the development of the guidelines uh, of the, the child-friendly version of the Lanzarote Convention that we we had, we got it right. Uh, and I think that was uh, an important lesson uh, for us, which is why I think it is important for uh, children, uh, human rights defenders to be heard in an assembly such as here. And I think it would be interesting for us also to uh, benefit from this experience and this work, which has been done in the context of this uh, day of, of general discussion, in the context of the, 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 the Council of Europe work on human rights defenders, whether it is through the Parliamentary Assembly or through the, the relevant uh, uh, expert body working on human rights defenders. So I'm really looking forward to being able to integrate the, the, the child uh, rights uh, aspect in, uh, in that part of our, our work. Essa, esse acordar, a importância de ouvir os jovens, ouvir as crianças para que eles possam dizer o que uhum. é e que ela quer fazer mais e mais parte disso. É, sim, é, eu também considero isso muito importante, até porque durante muito tempo, é, dentro da luta por direitos humanos em si e direitos de crianças, os próprios é, sujeitos de direitos não participavam dessas discussões. Uh, and I agree with you, especially because for a long time we, the subjects of the human rights, uh, were not able to speak or to give our, our view of. E na minha opinião, não há maneiras de se construir é, políticas públicas ou efetividade de direitos sem que os próprios sujeitos de direitos opinem e digam qual a melhor forma de se fazer isso. And the way I see it, there is no way you can uh, have good public policies without listening to people who will be affected by that public law or whatever. Well, thank you to our panelists. Uh, I, I'm trying to leave some time for questions and answers. Um, uh, so we do have a little time left to do that. Uh, do we have any from the floor? Gentleman at the back. And then Christian. Hello, uh, my name is Ken Smith. I work for the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. Uh, I, I work on the participation team there. I was interested in the idea of uh, using the internet, the digital technology, technology to engage with our decision makers. Um, my experience is that quite often uh, engaging with the decision makers, even face to face, is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And getting our decision makers to listen to younger children and young people is also quite difficult. Um, never mind using what they said to shape policies and strategies and service use. So I'm interested, how, how do we convince our decision makers to use technology moving forward to engage with children and young people? You 
Yes, would you like to uh, respond to the... You want me to start? I think so. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll respond uh, briefly um, because it needs to be interpreted uh, for, for Melissa. Um, well, I think you, I would start by uh, letting uh, children and young people convey that message. I mean, that was, would be what I would uh, start with. Uh, uh, what we have... Um, done in the uh, in our work and just uh, just recently is uh, uh, to uh, recognize the importance of uh, children's rights being upheld also in the digital environment and we have just recently adopted new uh, council of europe guidelines to respect protect and fulfill the rights of the child in the digital environment this uh, these are new guidelines uh, from 2000 and uh, july 2018 and uh, I think that they are also an opportunity. They give you a, a little bit of a, uh, an incentive to go and meet with policymakers and to explain to them how important access to information, education, uh, right to assembly, privacy, data protection issues, right to education, uh, right to protection and safety, what are the remedies uh, that should be available for children. So I think that this is really an opportunity for states to uh, look at from a holistic way how legislation can and policy can be uh, brought uh, up to date in the in this digi digitally uh, challenging environment that uh, that we live uh, that we live in. So I think that's uh, this could trigger a little bit of thinking. And this is actually these are guidelines which were developed uh, following a day of general discussion that I attended uh, a few years back. I think it was maybe four years ago. And uh, I, I realized during that day of general discussion that uh, we needed to have a, uh, a comprehensive framework which explains exactly what the rights of the child are in the digital environment. So I'm very happy to have been able to bring this back to the committee so that they see the results, uh, at least in the Council of Europe member states, of their work. Did Melissa want to add something to, to that, Melissa? Mm -hmm. Uh, o, o espaço digital ele conecta pessoas e conecta pensamentos. Eu acho que a discussão feita através dele possibilita uma discussão mais ampla e uma discussão que seja eficaz e funcione para todas as pessoas. I think that the digital space is a very good place to spread knowledge and, and to make things uh, uh, go around easily. So it's good for, uh, it makes possible for people to understand what we really want and what we really hope. E fazer com que é, as lutas se conectem, porque luta por direitos existe em todos os lugares. Mas a forma como eu faço isso no Brasil é diferente de como as pessoas fazem aqui em Genebra, por exemplo. And uh, this also gives a possibility to make the, the, the whole uh, Human rights fight become just one because they are all different in many different places. What we face, what she faces in Brazil, is different from what is faced here, and the internet can just connect it all and makes it more visible. Good point. Kirsten, I know you had a question, but we we are dramatically uh, running out of time. I really, it's um, can I ask if you could, if we do have some time at the end. Uh, it may be possible, but uh, I would like to move on to the next dialogue. Before I do that, can we thank our panelists, please, Regina and Melissa. The third and final dialogue is on child-led initiatives and protection online, and uh, Christina will introduce the speakers. Um, next up, we have Tomasa, a youth former representative of the study group on social media, and he's from Japan. And the child speaker is Konstantinos, who is 16 and from Greece. Hello, uh, my name is Konstantinos. I'm 16 years old and I'm from Greece. And I'm the founder of Teens for Greece. So Teens for Greece, to me, is a place where Greek teenagers can express their opinions and propose solutions for uh, issues concerning Greece, which is the country where I'm from. Um, that platform was created in... Uh, last year with the idea in mind that children are, are not heard throughout Europe and especially in my country. Also, uh, through my project, I try to empower the youth and by giving them my voice. My initial thought was that I would create a voting system where teenagers 
would um, vote for the best solutions, and then those solutions would be sent to uh, political parties. And uh, with this way, we could show uh, that teenagers have a voice, and they have ideas, and their solutions can be uh, ideal for uh, problems that exist. So actually, it is a forum of uh, six main subjects, which include the economy, education, um, society and human rights, entrepreneurship, and uh, business. So it's important to clarify that the forum does not connect to any political party, and it, as the idea behind is freedom of speech. What I want teenagers is to express their ideas without fearing any criticism from uh, teenagers or adults, because um, currently if someone writes their opinion on Facebook or Instagram, someone might criticize them or uh, even attack them with hate speech, and teenagers may be afraid to express themselves because of that. And uh, what I offer with my forum is safety from criticism. I mean, criticism can be uh, subjective because someone might judge your opinion, but with uh, a way that is acceptable by the other one. The problem is when there are uh, inappropriate words or inappropriate insults to the other person, which are not acceptable by anyone. So what I'm aiming is for a dialogue between teenagers from, Greek teenagers from all, of the, all over the world who have a voice and uh, have interest in uh, the problems our country is facing. Um, so my project was shared by over 60 new agencies in the world and in Greece. Uh, many of them include uh, Life, which is a really famous Greek uh, broadcaster, uh, Huffington Post US, and uh, Ethnic Kyrix, which is an American agency for uh, Hellenic people. I'm also creating two new campaigns now on the website called the Mentor Campaign and the Ambassadors. Uh, while doing this project, I saw that many teenagers were lacking vision and a role model. So through Teens for Greece, I decided to invite some world-renowned figures, such as uh, El Stamatopoulou, Peter Economidis, and George Fracas, uh, who will inspire teenagers and show them that there is a way out of their problems. Uh, for example, El Stamatopoulou uh, is currently the Columbia University Director for Intelligence People, and she worked in the UN for 22 years. Uh, Peter Konomidis is a global brand strategist and has received the Lifetime Achievement for, uh, from the Award for Hellenic Council of America. The ambassadors will be teenagers aged from 13 to 18, uh, which will uh, be responsible for sharing the idea to their, to their friends or to their neighborhood. Um, I'm also, I also want to thank uh, You Smile, Smile of the Child, Eurochild, and Child Rights Connect for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I will speak in Japanese. Uh, <clears throat> Translation uh, is on six. Uh, six. Uh, six. Uh, uh, six. Uh, six. Uh, uh, six. Uh, my organization is composed of about 60 university students. We work to provide opportunities for children to think by themselves about how to use the internet. We work with children from 10 to 18 years old in order to address issues particularly concern them, such as internet addiction, online bullying, online risks, including dating and flaming. Perhaps if you could start from the beginning, and the translation is on two, is that correct? Yes. Two, into English on two. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> My organization is composed of about 60 university students. We work to provide opportunities for children to think by themselves about how to use the internet. We work with children from 10 to 18 years old in order to address issues particularly concerning them, such as internet addiction, online bullying, online risks, including dating and flaming. Main forms of our work are called catering lectures and smartphone summit. We go to schools for catering lectures. In cooperation with mobile phone companies, the police and members of school education board, we provide about 300 lectures per year. 
Smartphone Summit is a workshop held upon requests from local municipality, which children are main drivers. 20 to 40 children are brought together and they discuss issues related to smartphones and come up with measures against issues. This is held in about 20 places every year. We see its positive impact since children not impose ideas from adults, but they come, up, they come up with rules and measures by themselves. Since the number of victims for, since the number of victims for incidents of sending self-produced images is increasing, increasing recently, we are particularly working on this issue. The other day, regarding the issue, high school students themselves discussed about why they send a selfie and how, they, how can they reduce incidents. Those high school students said, we the high school students do not fully understand the risks of this matter, so we should inform other high school students about this issue. And they stressed to adults about the necessity of awareness raising. Also, there are many examples that children organize lectures and workshops at school after our activities, meaning that these children transform themselves from participants to agents of actions. I think that there are two factors in the smartphone summit which help children, which help children think seriously about issues by themselves and take action for solutions like these examples. The first factor is that university students who are in between of children and adults are supporting them. We, the youth, are familiar with the internet as much as children. We can understand their feelings because our ages are close. Children speak more freely and openly when we support them. Young people's engagement with children has great positive impacts. The second factor is that local municipalities design a budget to provide a space for these dialogues as their program. Regrettably, the reality is that the number of supportive guardians is small. Uh, it is not uncommon that adults are indifferent or don't listen to their voices. But the cooperation of adults is essential. At the Smartphone Summit, children feel that adults are listening to their opinion seriously and why they are discuss what they are discussing are important. Therefore, they participate in the summit seriously. I believe mechanisms that local municipalities and governments provide opportunity for children to fully discuss issues concerning their safety online, in particular the issues in the internet, with support of use. This mechanism should be widely available throughout the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, and the floor is open for questions or comments. Oh, sorry, you still? Uh, yes, uh, continue. Yes, sir. I'll ask a question to Tomomasa, and Tomomasa will ask one question. Okay, okay. Uh, so my question is, um, what are the dangers children face while being online, and how can the government, state different state factors, protect them from those dangers while at the same time um, maintaining their privacy and, pro and uh, not restricting their uh, rights? It's for the for children to use the internet, uh, children need to make judgments by themselves to allow them to use the internet safely without restricting their freedom. State agencies should provide opportunities for children to think about the issues in the internet, including incorporating programs on the use of internet in education. So my question to Konstantinos is, so what are challenges uh, in your activities? Um, so in my activities, I face uh, many challenges. Um, first of all, concerning uh, teenagers being afraid to um, voice out their opinions. 
because they are afraid that they might be criticized by their uh, by the adults or um, even by their colleagues. Uh, I remember there was an incident that were, uh, there was this uh, child who wanted to participate in the forum, but uh, would not join in without um, using a fake name because uh, he was afraid that uh, the others would judge him for his opinions. And the thing is, on Facebook or on the other social media, you uh, have to use your real name because uh, now Facebook is doing checks in order to check your uh, validity of your account. Uh, my problem, I don't have a problem with using a fake name. That's why I lie it on the website. Uh, but I think that uh, teenagers and adults need to voice their opinion uh, without worrying um, criticism because um, constructive criticism and the dialogue is the foundation of democracy. But um, what's happening right now uh, with lots of um, even teenagers or young adults participating in extremist groups, that is becoming less and less a uh, democratic procedure. We see more uh, hate speech, we see more um, racist group growing, and that is something that is uh, restraining teenagers and young people. Very true, very true. All right, the, the forum is now open for questions and answers. Uh, we do have some time left. Yes, gentleman at the back. I'm Nakagomi from a, a Japanese mission. Um, my, my question is that in two, two of you that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the one of, for, you know, that uh, the representative for, uh, I mean, Tomomasa, that, uh, you know, he, uh, he talks about, uh, you know, that the importance of uh, local uh, government's involvement, but uh, is it uh, not to, you know, restrict uh, the, you know, uh, discussion among children, or is it a good way of, uh, you know, uh, expanding the space for the children. And uh, my question to uh, Constantinos is that uh, do you, wh what do you think about the you know, involvement of uh, you know, local co uh, you know, uh, government or the state government on, on the activities? Thank you. Uh, uh, clarification question on the internet activities or uh, so the question was the involvement of government on the internet activities or uh, overall? Oh, um, my my question is in uh, supporting your activity. Oh, the government. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the aim is for uh, the forum to be not a political connect to any party. Uh, however, uh, if a certain state uh, chooses to promote uh, children's rights and shows they can create programs which will promote and protect their children's rights. Well, uh, I'm open to discussion. However, I'm not promising anything because I need to see what's happening. But uh, if a government is willing to do something, then I'm open for a discussion. Do we have another question or comment? Uh, sorry, uh, Tomomasa, you wanted to say? Uh, can you repeat your question, please? Um, my my question is that uh, you know you said that um, the involvement of uh, you know local government is uh, important. Uh, the success of uh, you know uh, activities of children, uh, you, you, as you described, uh, but uh, isn't it uh, something that uh, to restrict the uh, freedom of ex expression among children? if you have any concern on this aspect. Uh, so your question about local, local municipalities making such opportunities. So if only adults make such opportunities without uh, participating with children, it is important that the young people, like us students, uh, to support children, such a, such a concerns uh, should be removed.
Yes, a question from over here. And then you. Yes, thank Hi. you. Take this part first. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm Caroline Wafu from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I also work with the gender section. Um, it was very interesting what you said regarding the strategies that you have in place to protect the safety of children that are uh, in the digital space. Uh, I would be really interested to hear also about the successful strategies that you have applied uh, for the protection of children who speak up on Internet and particularly those who have been targeted or harassed or attacked on, on the internet. Thanks. Okay, the interpreters have very generously given us some extra time. Thank you. So uh, we'll take this one first and then your one. Thank you very much. Um, can you please repeat the question for Swedish? The strategies are for protection of children that have been attacked in, on the internet, those who speak up. Um, so there hasn't been an attack. Oh. Yeah, so there hasn't been any attacks on my forum, um, but on Facebook, I think you can uh, specifically. Facebook, I think you can report the other comment for um, violence or um, ex ex uh, comments that are um, offensive. But uh, if something ha happens in my forum. If there is like, because um, I have some rules set in the form, for, for example, there is a, no one is allowed to swear or uh, be offensive to the other person. So if that happens, I warn the person that this comment will be removed unless changed. Um, and then um, if he doesn't comply with the rules, or of, obviously um, that person will get a warning and then he'll be banned from the forum unless he changes his um, stance against the other people and becomes respectful. Yes, and the question from here, this young lady. Hi, my name is Dulce Castillo. I'm from the Inter-American Children Institute. It's a really great job that you're doing here, Tobo Massa and Cosatino. We are developing a program that includes uh, students, parents, and teachers about the protections of children in internet. But I really want to know what have to need a platform to promote children rights by the internet. Because only we have doing this in Panama and Dominican Republic and they have lack of opportunity to access to the internet. But I prefer that you and Tomo Massa can help me to know what exactly tools have to have the, um, a platform to promote children's rights. Thank you. Uh, Tomamas, do you want to reply or should I reply? You can both. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, f first of all, you need um, to check the laws of your country in terms of uh, personal data and uh, Internet security, or like, because uh, some states have a restriction on uh, the age limit for teenagers to uh, sign up in certain um, platforms without the consent of the parents. Uh, for example, in Europe now it's 16 with the new GDPR law. Um, in the US, they have the COPA law, but I'm not sure exactly what the age limit is. And then you have to uh, create the website, of, of course, uh, in which form you want it. You can use various tools such as WordPress or a uh, variant. But um, I think you might need uh, programming in order to set the forum. And then um, for the website, you can just use the tool to uh, change things while the website has been done. You can then set um, the tool where you can change the banners and the front page. Can you repeat your question, please? If you have any recommendation uh, about platform for children's rights, what kind of told, uh, what what kind of of told have to have 
when a platform to promote children rights. <laughs> so, so, sorry, I can can I get back to you later? Oh. We've still got a few minutes available. Oh. Well, uh, it's time to then uh, wrap. Uh, sorry, do we have? Oh, perhaps, Kirsten, you, uh, if, if you can remember your question from uh, 20 minutes ago, uh, we have one or two minutes available. Thank you. That was actually a question to Melissa, uh, and it was kind of in line with the question that was asked uh, here. Um, I was wondering, how do you manage to actually get to speak to, to the government, be they community government or the central government? Because if they are not on, on social media, do you approach them in any other way? And the other part of this, do they feel threatened by your activities? Or do they just accept that what you do and they listen to you and they do what you want? <laughs> Thank you. É, geralmente são as gestões municipais, porque cada grupo atua em sua cidade. E o diálogo, primeiramente, ele é feito pessoalmente e ele é continuado através das redes sociais. Uh, we work on county, uh, county governments. We, we start by having a dialogue with them, a personal meeting with them. And then after we meet with them and start the, the process, then we move to the social medias. É, realmente, alguns, algumas lideranças, alguns, alguns membros do governo é, não se abrem a esse diálogo. E o que a gente faz é buscar pessoas que possam nos apoiar. Então, se aquele determinado é, governo, aquele determinado político não nos apoia, nós buscamos algo ou alguém que possa nos ajudar é, que seja diferente da linha de pensamento ou do grupo que ele participa. And not everybody uh, uh, receives us or talks to us or is ready to work with us. And when that happens, we just look for another person, some influential person, another politician that has the same line of thinking that we do and then we try to make it happen some other ways if we cannot go straight. É, o importante é que a gente persista é, e que a gente faça com que o nosso trabalho seja efetivado e não desista de buscar a efetividade dos nossos direitos. The important thing is not to give up. We never give up. We keep trying and trying until we get what we need. Yes, indeed, we do. And uh, um, uh, so my question is for uh, a final question here from Constantina. Yeah, uh, for the second working group. Um, and uh, I want to ask, um, what do you think about uh, the rise of, of extremist groups in? Uh, Europe and how can uh, the Council of Europe uh, combat this, and, and specifically the involvement of uh, children and young people in this? That's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you for for providing me with the opportunity to to uh, to respond to that or to to reflect a little bit. I'll try to be short to save the interpreter's uh, um, efforts. Um, Children that are uh, embarked into uh, extremist movements are uh, children which we consider to be uh, in a very, very vulnerable uh, situation. So uh, they are children that, uh, of course, uh, all normal rights uh, apply to them, but uh, we feel that there is a um, trend or a tendency in Europe uh, 
uh, especially when um, for, for concerning the criminalization uh, of those uh, acts that those children may or may have may have have committed. So we are very much uh, concerned about that. This is uh, there is work uh, under uh, way in the Council of Europe, which is going to look at this specifically, uh, together with uh, the role of women uh, in uh, in uh, uh, these radical uh, movements. I don't like using the term radical because I think it is, does not necessarily uh, explain exactly what it is that's uh, happening. Um, perhaps uh, extremism um, is, a, is a better uh, word. Um, so there is a, a conference which is being organized now in the next, in next uh, year, in the first part of 2019, where we're going to look at, uh, um, from, a, from a, a, the bigger picture of... Uh, what is happening and what can our states do to to support children that uh, come back, um, to support children uh, that are left behind, uh, to support children uh, whose parents leave. Um, so it is a, a it is a big issue. I don't have the the right response right now, but this is uh, something that uh, we are going to have to look at very seriously. Um, the states uh, in the Council of Europe, uh, they have uh, a different approach uh, among themselves to this, and uh, we are concerned that the rights of the child that has, uh, for example, been obliged to commit uh, uh, a crime uh, is, uh, is in a situation which needs to be uh, considered very carefully and, uh, of course, uh, by upholding the, the rights of the child, uh, first and foremost. But thank you for asking that question. <laughs> And thank you. Uh, online space is so much a part of all of our lives these days. And I don't know about you, but I find this dialogue very, very stimulating and, and, and enlightening. And uh, my children are always telling me off about behavior online and online issues. And uh, this is very, very important stuff. Um, I would like to conclude by turning the floor over to Christina to uh, thank uh, the speakers and, and also everyone for their attendance. Um, first of all, I would like to give a big thank you to all the panelists for their contributions to share their views and experiences. And another thank you for all the questions that coming from the crowd today. Um, I believe that each of us can take something um, special home today from this like fruitful conversation. And I also hope that through this discussion and the many more that's happening today, we can finally reach our goal for the children and their rights. Thank you. Thank you. One, one final point. Please be back in here at 3 o'clock for the next uh, working group uh, session. And uh, during lunch, there are side events in the mezzanine floor, one floor up, uh, that I would urge that you have a look at. They are very interesting and informative being run. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the interpreters. This call has been disconnected. Thank you for joining.